first meeting of the Rotary Club of Louisville. I'm Barry Barker, president-elect of our club and executive director of TARC. Uh, you will notice I am not Tony Kemper. He, boy, he was supposed to be here, but he's been uh, exhausted this week since his appearance with the rocking Rotary Band. Barry. Uh, to, to introduce our guest, David Jones Sr., uh, clearly there is no introduction necessary, but for a few of you who are younger in the room than many of us who have been around here a long time, let me just say a couple of things. David, a lifelong Louisville of, a lifelong resident of Louisville, grew up in the West End, said that many times to us, uh, understands the school system of Louisville well, went to the University of Louisville, and I'm proud to say became a CPA after that. Went on to the Navy, served his three-year term in the Navy, came back under that GI Bill, went to the Yale Law School, uh, actually taught in their economics department at, while he was at Yale and Law School, uh, graduated from Yale, uh, came to Louisville, came back to Louisville to uh, first practice law, and then along with his partner, Wendell Cherry, co-founded Humana so many years ago. The, the, the CEO of Humana, I think, for 37 years and 40, 44 years as the, as the chairman, building that great Fortune 500 company here in Louisville, more of which we need. Uh, so he's done wonderful things for this city. Uh, he's, his, his reach goes around the world. He's a member of the Business Roundtable. He's, he was, uh, Romania gave him an award for fixing their health care system in Romania, and other things in the list would go on and on and on. He's the co-founder of the, the committee, uh, the strategic committee for Louisville's agenda, better known as SCALA, and has asked uh, a number of people here, including myself, to, to assist in trying to work through some of these problems that we have and hopefully bring some solutions. So with that said, I'd like to introduce David Jones, Sr. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> it's great to be here again to speak to the Rotarians especially to one of the largest clubs in the United States. I'm told that you're 14th out of 34,000, is that about right? Yes. Wow. You know, can you all hear okay with back there? Okay. I love having the opportunity to speak to you. The Pledge of Allegiance to our flag is very stirring. It reminds me of how proud I am of our three sons, each of whom served our nation. Dave Jr. in the State Department, Dan, like me, in the Navy, and Matt, who recently retired after 27 years in the Marine Corps with a Purple Heart, Bronze Star, and multiple combat action ribbons. Most of you are too young to remember an international Rotary Club program called Gift of Life. A club in a third world nation would provide airfare for a child with a serious heart defect and the child's physician to travel to the states. There, a Rotary Club would provide for a hospital and a skilled physician to operate on the child. The accompanying physician would observe the procedure and for a few weeks while the child recovered, be trained by the American doctor. In the early 1980s, Louisville's famed heart surgeon, Alan Lansing, joined with Humana Hospital Audubon and your club to participate in the Gift of Life program. Allen donated his services, Humana donated needed hospital services, and Rotarians paid travel expenses. Allen operated successfully on 50 children from around the world. <clears throat> thanks, Allen. Thanks, Rotarians. I've been asked to say a few words about the Steering Committee for Action on the Louisville Agenda. That's a mouthful, so we call it SCALA. The group formed last year because Chuck Denny, Sandra Frazier, and I, who had worked together to help get the Lewis and Clark Bridge built, were disappointed that local leadership failed to allow Walmart to build a large and greatly needed store on the corner of 18th and Broadway, just five blocks from my longtime home at 1737 Garland Avenue. I just can't tell you how disappointed I was at our uh, 
lack of capability to allow Walmart. It would have provided 300 jobs, affordable food and other things, but most importantly, hope. That disturbed me so much that I said to my friends, why don't we put together a group <clears throat> and see if there's any way to uh, get out of this pit of mediocrity. Chuck mentioned that Nashville had long had a group composed of its proven leaders, each having earned the chief executive spot in a significant enterprise. They met four times per year for one hour. Their purpose, to learn about local problems and opportunities and to consider how they might help solve the problems and support the opportunities. So we identified a group of pro proven Louisville leaders who care about our town and its future. We asked them to suggest others. Membership is still open for proven leaders. We ask our members to list five serious local problems. In rank order, the five are public K through 12 education results, public safety, air service, pensions, and tax reform. We decided to consider and learn all we could about the top three. Public school results, public safety, and air service committees were created by volunteers. The education and air service committees have already reported, providing useful information. The public safety committee will report at our next meeting. All this has happened since last April when we first started. So you can see that we hit the ground running. That, appear, that apparently proved to be unsettling to some who may be unfamiliar with results-oriented entities. <laughs> uh, we were called secretive, nefarious, and elitist. In a sense, we are elitist. Each member has achieved the highest position of leadership in a significant enterprise. But we weren't born that way. Let me give you some examples. Teresa Reno Weber, Chief Executive Officer of Metro United Way. <clears throat> she re recently led a remarkable annual fund drive which raised $36 million, a 44% increase over the $25 million they'd raised the year before and had been at that level for many years. How about Teresa? <laughs> Was she born with a silver spoon? Don't think so. She's a graduate of the Coast Guard Academy. She spent, she spent six years at sea. I spent three years at sea, so I know something about that. But the Coast Guard goes out in, in rough weather all the time as her ship responded to sailors in distress. She's a, an amazing lady. Reverend Kevin Cosby, many of you know Kevin, pastor of the St. Stephen Church down at 15th and Kentucky Streets. When he began to pastor that church, they had 300 members. Today they have 14,000. He's also president of the rapidly growing Simmons College of Kentucky. And your speaker, I'll be the next example. I was born in 1931, a child of the Depression, one of six kids. My dad lost his job in 1938 and remained unemployed till 1942. My mom sometimes worked the night shift in a laundry, was sent home by cab at midnight or 2 a.m., yet it was always up in time to get us all clean, fed, and off to California Elementary School, then Parkland Junior High School, and for me, Mayo High School, where I graduated in 1949. Great public schools all. Back then, public schools knew how to teach kids to read. Because of clear expectations and good teachers, I learned to read comprehensively, write coherently, and understand basic math. My entire career is based on the foundation, the educational foundation that I received. But I had no money for college, so I worked for a year on tobacco markets in three states. I took the Navy ROTC exam, did well, and was granted a full scholarship to the University of Louisville. Each summer, we spent six or seven weeks on training duty. <coughs> the rest of the summer, <coughs> I worked as a hod carrier. Do any of you know what a hod is? You carry cement. So I was a member of the hod carriers union. After three years of active Navy duty at sea, I attended the Yale Law School with the GI Bill paying my tuition, but not our living expenses. 
Betty had taught <coughs> junior high school in Norfolk and had planned to teach in New Haven, but couldn't as we were expecting Dave Jr. who was born in 1958. Our daughter Sue was also born in New Haven in 1959. To support our growing family, I worked three jobs while in law school, teaching at night at Quinnipiac College and daytime in Yale College, and working odd hours for a CPA named Irv Lasky. I had passed the November 1954 CPA exam, and that credential allowed me, even as a student, to obtain some very good jobs. <coughs> Betty and I loved our years in law school where we made wonderful lifelong friends. I made good grades that led to terrific job offers, including the one I accepted upon graduation in 1960 with Wyatt Grafton and Sloss here in Louisville. Our kids had four grandparents. That's the main reason that I came back to Louisville. <coughs> Driving home from the Yale graduation in our eight-year-old Dodge station wagon, pulling an old $15 trailer, our fan belt broke on the Pennsylvania turnpike. The repair cost $20. Result, when we arrived in Cincinnati the next morning, we didn't have enough gas to make it to Louisville. Our dilemma, should I pawn my watch? Don't get much for a Timex. <laughs> but they keep good time and they glow in the dark. I could call my brother Logan and ask him to meet us in Car Carrollton, or I could ask the manager of AAA to cash a $5 post-dated check. Gas was about 20 cents a gallon back then. I chose AAA, and the kind, kind manager cashed my check. Betty's dad loaned me the money to cover the, to deposit and cover the check. There are nice people everywhere. Just over a year later, on August 18th, 1961, 1961, a year after I finished law school, my law colleague and close friend, Wendell Cherry, and I started Humana. We each invested $1,000. I borrowed mine from Household Finance. Later, we added realtors Sonny Bass and Charlie Weisberg and contractors Bill Rommel and Jim McFerrin as investors. We built a nursing home. It opened on August 10, 1962. The contractors later sold their shares to Wendell and me, while Sonny and Charlie stayed along for the ride. By 1969, we became the largest nursing home company in America. By 1978, we were the largest hospital company. Our insurance business, begun in 1985, is now about a $60 billion enterprise. Our hospitals were spun off to shareholders in 1993. Nursing homes were sold in 1972. In 1999, we embraced and pioneered the digital world, leading our industry. We had our initial public offering 250,000 shares at $8 each about 50 years ago on January 31, 1968. Now suppose your dad bought you 100 of those shares for $800 and reinvested the dividends. On January 31 this year, the 50th anniversary of our public, initial public offering, that $800 had grown to $4,260,900. That's a compound rate of return of 18.7% for 50 years. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> All our growth and change during my 44 years as leader occurred with the same locally recruited team. Wendell was from Harse Cave, Carl Pollard was from Lancaster, Kentucky, Bill Ballard, a Trinity graduate, and so on. I tell you that because Life is about people, not place. Anything that can be done anywhere can be done here. That's my story. I was born poor, not an elite. I'm still the same guy who grew up with good values, a good education, and a strong work ethic in Louisville's California neighborhood. Our scale of members have followed a variety of paths to leadership. Each is now giving freely of time and talent to make Louisville a better place. I honor and thank each of them. Scale is not, nor do we wish to be, secretive. Our goals are community goals, not private ones, to improve institutions and situations that touch and sometimes victimize nearly everyone who lives in our region. We're still relatively new, 
less than a year versus Nashville's 25 years. And as such, we're learning and we're evolving. Please stay tuned to see if scale can make a difference here as similar groups have in many cities. As many of you know, Scala is not the first group with which I've worked. I spent 13 years from 1990 to 2003 as co-chair of the Partnership for Kentucky Schools. We helped to achieve a $1 billion state tax increase to support CURA, the Kentucky Education Reform Act. Various groups with which I've served built and financed both Waterfront Park and the parklands of Floyd's Park, where last year, by the way, we had 3,050,000 3, visitors, first year that it was all open. <laughs> we built and partly financed the Kentucky Center for Performing Arts. We created adaptive reuses for the Belknap buildings, Vincenzo's, the cast iron front buildings next to the Humana building. There's one undertaking of which I'm particularly proud. That's the 1983 rescue of the University of Louisville Teaching Hospital, which lost about $5 million in 1982 and also lost its accreditation. The brand new state-built replacement hospital on Preston Street was scheduled to open on January 1st, 1983, but UofL refused to accept it. It was scheduled to lose $10 million that year. One local voluntary hospital offered to open and operate it, provided that the city, county, and state agree to cover any losses. Humana leased the building without those guarantees and operated it as Louisville's, University of Louisville's teaching hospital. Far from losing $10 million in 1983, the hospital broke even. The following year, it won back its accreditation, becoming the first charity hospital in America to do so with distinction. Now, I tell this historic tale for a specific and important reason. This remarkable transformation from a failed institution to one of distinction was accomplished by the very same employees who engineered its failure. It wasn't the people. Answer, clarity of mission, inspired leadership, and complete authority, which owners always and legitimately receive. Prior to Humana's ownership, there was no leader with complete authority. The city, the county, the Board of Health, the medical school, and its numerous silos each asserted authority, creating conflict and untold confusion. Don't ever accept responsibility without authority. I don't, I haven't, and I won't. Now, why is this example important? Because it offers hope. The failed medical school hospital, like our public schools, was the last resort of the poor. Since it could be fixed, there is hope that our public schools can also be fixed. Consider the most recent data from Jefferson County Public Schools. Only 29% of African American elementary students are proficient in reading. 71% are not. This is unacceptable by any standard and must be fixed. Rotarians, known throughout the world for good deeds like your Gift of Life program, Please join SCALA in seeking ways to help ensure that our public schools teach all students, especially the disadvantaged, to read. Thanks, Rotarians, for allowing me to tell our story. Sure. This is the most fun part. We have plenty of time for questions, so fire away. Mr. Jones, I'm Larry Sloan, and thank you so much for coming today. It was an inspiring speech. My question is, I went to school about the same time you did. I learned how to read. Uh, we read at home, too. But what do you think the problem is? Why can't it seem so simple? to learn how to read on reflection, what is wrong? I think it's a resource allocation question. It's a huge budget of about $1.6 billion. The school board has the authority to raise taxes without any further legislative approval. So I don't think resources are the problem. They have about 16,000 employees, of whom only 6,600 or so are teachers. 
fewer than 7,000 out of 16,000 are teachers. I'm not a, a, the person who's going to fix that, but I believe that if some structural issues are dealt with, first of all, uh, we've had superintendent after superintendent with great credentials. I'm sure the new one, uh, Marty Polio, does as well. But the school superintendent can't even choose his or her own direct reports. Those are tenured positions, so it's a little bit like the, the governor and having Steve Bashir as his chief lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, the superintendent can't, can't uh, choose or remove principals. The board has to approve every single school trip every expenditure of $5,000 or more. I'm told it takes 25 hours a week just to read the material that comes to the board members. So the, the, a lot of that is done by state law. So it's, it, but if, I think it needs a cataclysmic event like the university hospital going broke and the university saying we're not taking it anymore. I don't know what that cataclysmic event might be, but I do think if the governor heard from enough of us that something needs to be done, then the state probably has the capability of fixing it. To fix it, all it needs, I think, is clarity of vision. What's the school system for? To teach kids to read, to write, and calculate. That's the base. The next question is, what resources are necessary to get that done? The way we built Humana was always placing resources only behind things that help the mission. If somebody wanted resources for something that doesn't help the mission, we said no. So I think that it can be fixed. I think it must be fixed. I think it won't be fixed locally because of the, neither the school board nor the superintendent have authority. So as a follow-up, are you saying that the people who are running it don't have the authority? Uh, is that that's what you said earlier was a problem? That's correct. And the, remember, I said with the hospital, the same people who were there when it failed, once they had leadership and clarity of vision, fix it. We have great teachers. The teachers deserve to be part of a winning team. To do that, someone has to create the conditions that allow them to do that. For kids who come from a very disadvantaged background, maybe have never been read to or read a book, they may take five or 10 times the resources. Currently, there's a sort of one size fits all. I'm not an expert on that, but I am an expert on fixing things that don't work. What's next? Thank you. Hi, David, Patrick Welsh. Thank you for all you've done uh, for the city over the years. Uh, as you've answered a, a lot of my question, but are you essentially saying that there should be someone at the state level who really totally runs and controls, has the authority to control the Jefferson County school system? This, this is, Louisville is not the only place where there are problems with education. And one of the reasons I think for all the hoo-ha about what scale is up to is that we've apparently touched a nerve that someone's perhaps concerned about change that may, that may happen. There have been a number of places where either a mayor or a governor, the city or the state, has taken over the schools. It's happened in New York, in Chicago, Washington, D.C., and many, many places. I'm not sure exactly what powers the governor or the commissioner of education have but I think to fix the schools, that it's going to take a takeover of the, of the schools. I think the lack of authority, I, truthfully, I don't know who runs the schools. I know they've got a whole lot of people in administration. I know they have a, a big budget. I think, the, I think if enough citizens of Louisville, and you know, I've called on you all to join scale in seeking a solution. I think the answer is to give the governor a call and say it needs to be fixed. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Good afternoon, Mr. Jones. Thanks for being here. I'm Barbara Sexton Smith. And to come back to where our conversation began today, when you talked about the cataclysmic event of the loss of Walmart at 18th and Broadway and how that causes all hope to be lost in that area. What kind of hope do you see on the horizon at 18th and Broadway with the $167 million developments there with the Passport Health and Wellbeing Campus along with the Republic Bank Foundations, YMCA, and then of course, as Barry Barker knows all too well, the rapid transit um, center that will happen there. Do you see hope on the horizon there? And if so, what might that look like? I don't see nearly as much hope as I had when the Walmart was going there. The, uh, you know, as a council member that you've heard from me on this subject, uh, I believe that putting power in the hands of people who have no skin in the game, they don't have to even live near it. To, in a zoning hearing, if you live so, within a certain distance of the, of the property, you have certain rights to status so that you can sue if you don't like the outcome. But in the area of the preservationists and the so-called so -called preservationists, I doubt that half of those people who uh, killed Walmart have ever been to 18th Street. They have no skin in the game. They have, I, I'm having trouble visualizing what they, uh, how that made somebody feel to kill the hope and the opportunity for that neighborhood to, what, what could have possessed the people who, who did that? I, I just don't understand people like that. And I don't understand the city not getting it done in spite of people who, uh, you know, you can always say, well, it's somebody else's responsibility. They're in, in the court. Uh, I'm after results. And we have been let down big time. And it's, the YMCA, of course, will be a wonderful thing there. Passport's just another office. It's not the same thing as a place that brings in thousands of people and jobs and all those, those things. It's, I'm sure it's better than an empty lot. <laughs> Growing up in that neighborhood, I know that the buildings were never built out to the sidewalk, which was the pretext. Some governmental agency, I don't know if it was the city council or the state or whatever, has created in these faceless boards the power to kill deals. And it's time for that to end. And the, whoever gave those people the right, the status to take that to court, those laws ought to be changed. When something's the first rule of holes is when you're in one, stop digging. And many of you, none of you are as old as I am, but I watched the uh, NIMBYs hold up the bridges for 50 years. Smart people, good lawyers, our friends in high places. All that was enabled by uh, the laws that were put on the board, I think, with good intent. But I think all those things should become advisory and not have the power to, uh, to kill a deal like that. Too much on Walmart. Who's next? That's all right. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. I want to um, thank you for being here today and thank you for, for what you're doing with Scala. And I, I want to thank a couple other people because today wouldn't have happened if Neville Blakemore hadn't suggested to the speaker committee that we ask you to speak. And it really wouldn't have happened if Mike Mountjoy didn't make a phone call and, and ask you. And uh, we really appreciate you coming and, and telling us about Scala because there's so many misconceptions out there. So my, my question is, uh, you've talked a lot about JCPS. We had uh, 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 Luke Schmidt came tell us about the airport initiative for direct flights. What are a couple other really important initiatives that you guys at Scala are hoping to accomplish? Well, the other two that we're working on are public safety, and we're going to have a report. Uh, Teresa Reno Weber and uh, Jennifer Hancock are the co chairs of that committee at our meeting on. March 20th, we'll hear their report, and hopefully we'll learn a lot more about that issue. And then we've already had a report from our Air Service Committee, and I think our Air Service Committee has been working with another group called LRAD that's working on that uh, issue. You know, there's no nonstop flights to Boston or to the West Coast, and we have lots of people that are driving to Nashville and Indianapolis and Cincinnati to catch airplanes, and we have other issues, but. The, we identified five. The other two besides those three were pensions and tax reform, which were more of a state issue. So we're uh, 
we're working on them in the sense that what we're trying to do is learn about them to see then if there's a way for us to be helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Tom Crimmins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jones, for your efforts and your group's efforts. Uh, as you may know, our club has a signature program is the Rotary Promise Scholarship Program. We've tried to do our part to improve things in public education uh, in the community, and I'm just curious about what your thoughts are on that, and how else can we help, how else can we support your efforts? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for doing that. Uh, I know all about the program out at Western High School because our family foundation was involved in, in that, and I think it's a really wonderful program. I think everything that you're doing to encourage people to, to become educated and to deal fairly with other, other people. Uh, you know, you're, there's a reason why you have such a wonderful club here, because what you're doing is not only honorable, it's the thing that we all ought to, to be doing. Uh, you know, I think it all goes back to the, the golden rule and you all are real exemplars of that. And for me, it's a great pleasure to be here. Are there some more questions? Thank you so much for being here today. I'm Cynthia Miles Brown with Sinorama Dixie. Could you elaborate a little bit more on your vision of Scala and how to incorporate different people from different parts of the community into your group? And then kind of timelines, ideas of where you see as a vision where the group's gonna go? The, uh, there are groups like Scala in lots of cities. A lot of them have been around for a long time. Pittsburgh, I've told, has had one for about 75 years. Nashville started, I think, in 1994. Uh, other, other, other cities have them. <coughs> because I tend to get right to the point, the, uh, we got started really fast, and in really less than a, a year, we not only uh, had reports from two of the three committees with the third one coming up, but we've kind of uh, set off a harness nest or something. <laughs> I'm not sure why we're so uh, frightening. We don't really have an agenda other than to be aware of the agenda for the city. There are plenty more problems than the five that we happen to identify. Uh, Chuck and I asked the members, of whom there are about 70. We've had several uh, new ones. I've invited the uh, Marty Polio now that this there is a superintendent of schools to join. I haven't heard back, but I hope he's going to attend the, the next meeting. I've invited the uh, uh, Todd Dunn, the head of the United Auto Workers, and John Scoball, the head of the Teamsters, to join our, our group because uh, uh, membership is open for people who've, who've achieved a, a position of leadership. We have a very diverse Group. We have the archbishop, we have the rabbi, we have the preachers, we have the educators, we have, and we have some business leaders. Uh, the private sector is entitled to a say. Is, I think you'd all agree with that, or most, most of you would. The, uh, my hope is that it will have a long life and that it will be able, to, in some manner, to be helpful. Good afternoon, I'm Alice Bridges, and I am serving as a consultant to Passport on their health and well-being campus, so just want to really quickly set the record straight that the phase one of their project is a headquarters office building, but it is a 20-acre campus that will have retail and housing and many, many services. So um, not to say one is better than the other, but it is a dramatic uh, and significant investment in that community that very much deserves it. My question question is, you've invited Rotary to become involved in SCALA. How does, what does that look like? What can we do? <laughs> call, call the governor and tell him we want to fix the schools. <laughs> Seriously. Okay. The, uh, I'm sure what's going to go down there is better than what is there now. I've actually uh, had two Walmarts uh, in part of my life today. I'm part of the evil empire, real estate development. And there are two Walmart stores that were built on property that I developed, that my Main Street Realty campaign developed. And I've seen what happens when a Walmart comes. 
all sorts of things happen because they sell a lot of stuff, but they don't sell everything. And it would have been a huge magnet for that area. And there was the land was there, the, everything was right except a bunch of uh, self-appointed busybodies uh, who had absolutely nothing to gain from that. All they did was cause problems. I don't understand people like, like that. I do know, uh, I mean, I've run into problems in my life. I've made mistakes in my life. And anybody that does much is going to have that as well. But everybody in this room is a doer. I know all about the Rotarians because I've been privileged to speak to you before. I never joined because I can't be to any place every week. <laughs> but I honor you all for doing it. And thanks again for. Thank you very much.